this morning. Uh, so we're going to have a sermon on the spot um, morning this morning, and let me tell you a little bit about how this came to be. So earlier um, this calendar year, I spent about a week and a half at a Benedictine monastery in central Wisconsin. Uh, talking about Benedictine spirituality, but one of the uh, one of the most interesting uh, components we had was kind of uh, or learning sessions we had was ministry as improvisation, and ministry as improvisation not necessarily to get each other laughing, but to be attuned with how the Holy Spirit might work in our lives in unexpected ways and in unexpected methods. And it was uh, kind of a challenge for us to go back to our ministry context and figure out ways um, where we didn't have anything planned and to make room for the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the suggested, suggested methods. So um, I did this twice during the summer months, and, um, and they were great. There was great, great questions asked. Uh, but then I was challenged by a member missionary of People of Hope who came up to me and said, Pastor Dave, that's great that you did that, but I bet you won't try to do it when more people are here. And I was like, well, I'm going to show you. <laughs> so here are the graphics. I'm going to do my best to answer every question, but I have the opportunity, if I need to take some more time to think about a response, to say, I will get back to you on and if you wrote that question, please get back to me, and I will I will definitely provide you uh, with more information. Okay, I'm gonna try to get to most of the questions in the bowl, but the bowl is kind of full, and we're gonna set a time limit. Um, and we're gonna set that time limit. Where's John? John is a great time. Twelve minutes, I think, will go. Um, and I'll get to as many questions as I can. So. Here we go. How many of you are nervous for me? <laughs> ah. Okay, first question. Why do we say Christian instead of Catholic with small c uh, church? And I'm assuming that whoever wrote this question is referring to the way that we recite the Apostles' Creed here at People of Hope, where we substitute the word Christian for uh, the word Catholic with a small c. Now, I need to say that this is something that I did not implement when I came to people almost a decade ago. There's a long-standing history and tradition here at People of Hope of, of substituting that word Catholic with Christian. Um, so I'm going to say why I think we do it. Uh, first, it's important to notate or note that when we refer to the Catholic Church, uh, with small c, we are not referring to the Roman Catholic Church, which is overseen by the Pope in Rome, right? That's big c. That big c is specific Roman Catholic. Small c, Catholic, means universal church, or the whole Christian church, okay? It's an overwhelming kind of designation for all those who claim belief in Christ, okay? That being said, for some people, that different designation between big C and little c can get confusing. And Lutherans and Catholics kind of have a lengthy history of maybe not being all that friendly with each other. So part of that designation is, is I believe here at People of Hope, is to signify that we are a Christian church and part of the Christian church and not simply affiliated with the Roman Catholic Church. Second, reason I think we use that language. Um, People of Hope was founded way back in 1994 as a, as a congregation and as a place where people who have very little church background can come and feel um, accepted and feel valued and not feel left out because they don't know the insider language that sometimes we use at church. For example, how many of you know what a chasm is? Pitas, Ralphus, Or how many people of you know what a thurifer is used for? Okay, awesome. Or how 
how many of you know that this room is typically called the sanctuary, right? So most, most of you know that, right? Do you know that? Uh, anyway, so there's a whole bunch of insider outsider language that's used in the church. Because we're the church and we like to use fancy words for things. Chausables are a special kind of thing you put on when you are going to preside over communion. It's like a big um, table to us. Maybe, I don't know. It, oh, with all respect, right? But it's a big garment you put over. A third for you is what you, um, so you can dump it in, uh, there's two re kinds of third first. One, you put incense in and you throw it all over the place. The other one is it's like this magic wand that has a sponge in the end of it. It's usually made out of metal. You dump it in baptismal water and you throw the water at people to remind them of their own sins. Right? So, um, we use that uh, Christian church language as a way to break down that barrier of insider-outsider language to help make people feel more comfortable here at People of Hope. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. That took like three minutes. What are we doing for the recruitment of new people is the question. And whoever wrote this question, thank you for asking that question. And I would like to respond to you, what are you doing for the recruitment of new people? And I don't mean that uh, flippantly, but I was reading an article in a, uh, a church growth magazine about a month ago that talked about how people show up to congregations. 2% um, of people show up to congregations because they see an ad for a congregation somewhere, whether that's on Facebook or social media. 2% uh, find a congregation in uh, the phone book and decide to visit a geographical lo location. 2% of people show up to congregations uh, because a pastor invites them to be a part of a congregation. 94% of people show up to a congregation because a friend invites them to do so. Okay? So my question to you is simply, who are you inviting to come to join you at People of Hope? This place that you love and value, this place that's important to you, are you inviting people to come be a part of what we're doing here? Now, know and surely know that I certainly invite people to come to People of Hope. I've invited the guy who cuts my hair like 17 times. <laughs> okay. Um, he's shown up on a couple of occasions. But recruitment isn't a strategy. Recruitment's a way of living and sharing something that's of value with, with, to you with other people who you value in your life. So what are we doing? We're hopefully asking other people to come join us to see what the church is about. How do you maintain your faith while waiting for answers from God when patience seems like an impossibility? This is a huge question. Um, and one I struggle with uh, quite frequently. I'm a kind of an immediate gratification kind of guy. So if I think that I want a chocolate chip cookie, I go and find a chocolate chip cookie, regardless of whether what time of day or night that is, which explains a lot about me. Um, but how do you foster patience when you're patiently waiting for God to answer a question? I think um, there's lots of biblical examples of, of patiently waiting, um, but it's a struggle. It's a struggle. But it's, um, I think it's having faith that, that God doesn't give care and love for us, that God indeed um, wants to be there for us, that God in, indeed knows more about the specific situation um, or instance where we're asking uh, for patience or having to be patient than we do. I think it's recognizing that anything worth attaining or anything um, that's valuable takes time. I think, um, I think patience is a virtue and something we're called to as people of faith, something that we all fail about and with, but it's something that we're called to keep trying and, and keep trying to persevere. 
Uh, personally, when I'm stuck in a question where I'm trying to wait for God to answer, I look for the unexpected ways in which God might be trying to answer my prayer uh, that I don't normally pay attention to. Or that where places where those answers might show up in ways that I thought that were unexpected for me. Sometimes, sometimes that's through um, conversations uh, with people here in the church or outside of the church about what I'm thinking about or what I'm struggling with. Uh, sometimes it's through engage, engaging in the study of Scripture. Sometimes it's through, through silently sitting and praying and, and sharing my thoughts with God. Not that God talks directly to me, but when I separate myself from the, the chaos that, that happens in normal life, and separate myself and take time uh, just to be, sometimes the answers show up then. Uh, those are just a few of the ways that I try to remain patient while waiting for God to answer. This one's typed up, so that makes me nervous. <laughs> Romans 13, 1. Uh, does someone have a Bible with them? These Bible versions are, are listed, but 13, 1. All of you must obey those who rule over you. There are no authorities except those who rule over you. Romans 13, 4. The ones in authority serves God for your good. Romans 13, 5. You must obey them because you know it is right. Here's the question. To obey what is written in the New Testament is my ethical obligation as a Christian. But how do I rectify dictates like the ones in Romans when I think it is morally wrong to do so? So what I think this question is asking is, how do I object to the power, powers of authority in our lives when the people who operate in those positions of power and authority seem to dictate or act in ways that are counterintuitive to our understanding of how God wants us to operate in the world? Um, I'm just looking for a nod for, for anyone who maybe asked this question to make sure I'm kind of getting the ethos of it. I am, right? So, absolutely. Um, Luther, uh, I'm going to go to Luther here. Luther has a two kingdoms theory uh, or theology where the kingdom of heaven is established by God and this. Uh, that, and then there's an earthly kingdom, and that those earthly leaders should also inhibit or or uh, or listen and follow the dictates of God in the way that they rule. Um, now, what do you do when someone or something doesn't seem to be aligned um, uh, with with what you believe is the Christian message? Um, it's interesting that you pick out three passages from Romans, because I would go to Jesus. And I would I would see what Jesus does when he uh, operates in, in a political system that seems to oppress people, or, or throw people away, or, or tell them that they're not as valued. And when Jesus interacts with, with those systems, Jesus confronts the systems. Um, and that's what I think our calling as Christian people is, is that if, if there is a civil authority or whatever that might be uh, uh, acting counterintuitively to our understanding and operating theology about how God wants us to work in the world, then we are obliged to, as Christians, and engage in uh, some sort of advocacy to have that system changed or addressed in some way. Now, other Christians would say that that's wrong, but that's my understanding of how I'm called to operate in the world, right? So if, if I notice that someone is being pushed aside because of the color of their skin, um, I believe that it's my moral obligation and my faith obligation to speak up and say, hey, that's not right. What you're doing is wrong. Um, now, I would not like go punch the person in the face, but I would speak up, right? So um, 
what we're talking about is civil engagement as, as Christian people. What does that look like? Does faith inform the way that, that, that we want to be governed? Does faith inform the way that we interact with the world? Does faith inform the way that, that, um, that we want government to interact with the world? And I would say absolutely that any theology is also a political entity. Uh, that, that faith definitely informs the way that we engage politically. But there's also importance uh, to recognize that the way that we engage Theologically and politically, uh, should be a, done in a way that honors uh, Christ and honors the divine in the other as well. Um, but I would love to talk with whoever wrote that question more about that, because uh, I would love to hear what that person has to say. Um, John is indicating that my time is up. Um, thank you for engaging in this experiment. Uh, I, I'd love to talk to you all about the faith questions, so know that my door is always open. Um, and um, let's end in a word of prayer. So I invite you to please pray with me. Most holy and gracious God, I thank you for this day of grace, and I thank you for the opportunity uh, to gather here um, to um, ask tough questions. God, as, as, as we continue to be patient, um, and listen to your will in our lives. We ask that you continue to bless the work that we engage in, continue to bless our responses uh, to you, and continue to be with us in all that we say and do. God, you are holy, um, and we thank you for having the opportunity to dwell in that holiness. Uh, use us to be agents of change in this world. I pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord.